Hello and welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I am your host Narad Muni and I'm a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I'm a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. In this episode, we are going to do a folk tale from Bihar. The story features a prince who has perfected the art of stealing. Along with stealing jewelry and horses, he can also steal the heart of a princess. The story begins in a kingdom many centuries ago. This kingdom had a king called Raja. Raja cared nothing more than to use taxpayer money to ensure that his children got the best possible education. And because what I'm describing was a patriarchal society, when I said that he wanted his children to be well educated, I meant that he wanted his sons to be well educated in raja's mind it was a foregone conclusion that his sons were going to take over his kingdom's administration one day but as i was saying this king cared nothing more than ensuring that his children got a world class education so he sent them to the best university possible given the century they were in that best possible university was neither oxford nor cambridge nor harvard it was nalanda to ensure that his sons got the most attention from his teachers or rather than attention the highest grades raja donated heavily to the university yeah indeed this worked in the past just as it seems to work in some universities today and today raja was in a particularly good mood his sons were coming home after graduation there wasn't much in the way of a ceremony for graduates back in the day in fact communication being what it was the king wasn't even sure if they had graduated or if they had failed not that he thought they would fail considering all the money he had donated to the university raja received his children privately in his room it was better this way what if he questioned them in court and it turned out that they had majored in dishwashing or mopping floors that wouldn't do when he looked at his sons he was pleased to see that all three of them were holding their diplomas if they had all graduated then he could move on to the very important step of giving them their first jobs he asked his eldest son gyani what he had learned Gyani was happy to report that he had completed his bachelor's degree in economics. That was a while ago. He could have returned home right away after getting his diploma, but he decided to accompany his brothers. And while he was waiting for them to graduate, because he was bored and didn't have anything else to do, Gyani also completed a master's degree in business administration raja was extremely pleased he instructed gyani to head up the treasury and to start by auditing all the balance sheets for the kingdom and as a graduation gift he gave his boy a ring from his own finger the second son Nidar said that he had a diploma in warrior science. 
he had perfected the exquisite art of sword fighting. And that's not all, he could make swords too. His designs had become especially popular amongst a club in Japan called the Samurai or something. Whatever, he was getting a lot of orders from there. Raja was especially pleased. Nidar could now lead and train his armies. His son was going to become both the commander of the army and a weapon supplier to it. That may sound like there's a conflict of interest there. But don't worry. Tony Stark, as Iron Man, did that as well. Raja gave Nidar a chain from around his neck as a gift. If you've been listening to this show, you may have already anticipated what happened with the third son. What I mean is that every time you see two brothers or two sisters conforming to societal expectations, the third one steps up and says, not so fast, and bucks the trend. So it was in this case as well. Raja was happy and optimistic, given what he had heard from his first two sons. He was mentally prepared for one overachiever, one mediocre, and one underperforming child. And now that both Gyani and Nidar had shown that they were overachievers, he would gladly forgive his third son, even if he had become an artist. The third son, whose name was Kalakar, thought that this was a happy coincidence. Because guess what? He had indeed become an artist. Raja did his best to hide the sudden pang of disappointment that he felt. He instantly regretted what he had said about being okay with an artist in the family. But it was too late now. He had already spoken the words. He couldn't go back on that. Oh, that's nice, Raja mumbled. What exactly was Kalakar an artist of? Stealing, the lad replied. Raja confessed that he wasn't current on the goings-on in the art world. What sort of art was stealing? Was it a visual art, like painting or drawing, or a performing art, involving music, or dance, or acting? Or was it just a political term, like accusing your opponents of stealing an election? Kalakar explained that it was definitely a performing art. It was also a science to some degree, he said. You see, you have got to find an object before the owner has lost it. It's subtle, takes a lot of hard work and practice. And as a real test of your skills, the board of examiners require you to steal your diploma if you want to graduate. He went on to explain that he had been too smart for them. And he got a gold medal too. And, as personal souvenirs, a paperweight from the dean's office. All these pens, glasses and wallets from his professors. Raja didn't know how to react. He asked his boy if he was a kleptomaniac. But Kalakar clarified that a kleptomaniac has no choice. They steal because they can't help it. But Kalakar had a choice and he was very deliberate in his decision to steal. Which only embarrassed Raja further. The king remembered Kalakar as a young boy who seemed to lack interest in everything. 
and now it seemed that kalakar had discovered a passion did it have to be stealing how would he explain his son's behavior to his guests at the next royal ball if the kings and queens present kept complaining about losing their necklaces chariot keys rings and such raja would have to think of a strategy but for now he decided that he would reward the boy just because he had finished school he was about to take a ring off his finger when he realized he wasn't wearing any more rings that seemed odd to him until he realized that kalakar stood there grinning holding all of raja's remaining rings in his outstretched palm it was an ignoble profession raja thought but the boy was certainly good at it there was no denying it later that evening raja summoned kalakar to his bedroom and gave him an assignment he pointed to a bowl hanging from the ceiling and told kalakar that the crown jewels in the bowl were his assignment kalakar needed to steal them before sunrise tomorrow the catch was that he had to do it without waking up the king the bowl was also filled to the brim with water even the slightest movement would cause a little bit of water to spill on the sleeping king raja was a light sleeper and he would react extremely quickly to even a single drop of water maybe you've already guessed how kalakar did it he dipped down from the ceiling mission impossible style and he used a very long straw to siphon off the liquid bit by bit it took a long while but well before dawn kalakar had purloined not just the bowl full of crown jewels but also a few handkerchiefs the king's wallet an umbrella the king's favorite pair of skis and even the king's pet parrot with the cage included raja was impressed but he was still trying to find a way to neutralize this liability and then finally he got it he had a job for kalakar after all it was to steal a special horse from the neighboring kingdom what made the horse special was that it was white all over except the ears which were completely black raja already had a black horse with white ears he also had a horse with one black and one white ear but no horse exactly like the one owned by padosi the king of the neighboring kingdom at the last royal ball padosi had pointed it out enough times to raja so kalakar would have to go steal it it goes to show how passionate kalakar was about stealing that he didn't even suggest to his father that he simply buy the horse from padosi secretly raja was hoping that kalakar would get caught and hanged or something whatever the outcome that was going to be padosi's problem to deal with and even in the extremely unlikely case that kalakar succeeded hey raja would have completed his horse collection it was a win win situation for him when kalakar said that he needed at least a few weeks to execute his mission raja was enthusiastic about the prospect of having kalakar out of sight for so long he decided that he would also try to schedule as many royal balls as he could in kalakar's absence 
In fact, Raja tried to encourage his son to take longer. You mustn't hurry these things, you know. Why only weeks? Take a few months or years even. Observe carefully from the bushes and use your spy gear and all that sort of stuff. Find out the secret code to the stables and so on. Kalakar rolled his eyes at his father's hopelessly outdated methods. He mumbled an okay boomer and departed on his quest. Kalakar had one additional skill that his father was unaware of. The boy was an expert at taking care of horses. Guess what a happy coincidence this turned out to be. Kalakar was determined to rise through the ranks so as not to fire any suspicion. He observed that everyone in charge of the horse in question was someone Padosi personally trusted. So Kalakar couldn't just show up at the stables and ask if he would have a job taking care of Padosi's prized possession, the horse that was white all over but with black ears. The prince instead applied to be third assistant stable boy, understudying to the second assistant stable boy for some other horses in the king's cavalry. That seems far removed from the horse that he wanted to steal, but it was a sensible path, and ultimately it proved quick. I won't bore you with the politics of the stables, but let's just say that some convenient events kept happening over the next few weeks and months that soon saw the third assistant stable boy promoted to head stable boy and then stable undersecretary and then stable manager. For example, some lost items were recovered from the previous head assistant stable boy's locker and the boy was promptly fired. In another instance, the previous stable manager's recently departed relative was found to have an extra pot of gold, which was to be passed on to this previous stable manager, meaning he didn't have to work anymore. The vacancies created were immediately scooped up by Kalakar. And finally, one of Padosi's long-serving stable officers suddenly found the winning lottery ticket in his pocket, even though he didn't remember actually buying it. When the stable officer retired to live on his winnings, the choice of person to replace him was very clear. It would be Kalakar who would replace him, of course. All this while, Kalakar really did do a pretty solid job with the horses. He fed them, took care of them, and so on. He was able to demonstrate the improvements he made by proving that the horses ran faster and consumed less food. The princess of the land had this habit of riding a horse daily. And that horse, of course, was the one Kalakar was after. Every day, as she came by the stables, the princess admired this handsome new stable officer. He looked so princely, almost like one of the princes she had seen at Nalanda University. In a short while, she had fallen hopelessly in love with Kalakar. But if Kalakar noticed the princess, he didn't show it. He stayed laser-focused on his mission, which was to give everyone the impression that he wasn't a horse thief. That was a deeply-seated impression now, 
in everyone's minds, especially those of the palace guards. One dark, moonless night, Kalakar suddenly arrived at the stable and proceeded to take the horse out. Naturally, the security guards at the gate stopped him, to which Kalakar explained that the princess had herself summoned the horse. She wanted to go for a ride. He added a perfectly rehearsed shrug, as if to say, These royals and their whims and fancies, what are we to do? The guards, eager to demonstrate that they had hobnobbed with the royals too and understood their ways, agreed and let him pass. The next day, Raja was happy when Kalaka returned. His horse collection was finally full, but he worried what would happen to him. Padosi would find it especially suspicious that the same time that he lost his prized horse, Raja had acquired one. Finally, in consultation with his ministers, Raja decided to be completely honest with Padosi. Padosi's kingdom was a lot stronger. Even with Nidhar's leadership of his military and his ample weapons supply, it would not be wise to enter into an argument which might lead to battle with Padosi. So Raja wrote a letter confessing everything to Padosi. Raja also said that he was returning the horse and Kalakar as well, if Padosi wanted to chop his head off or something. It was only after Raja got Padosi's reply that Kalakar's father finally began seeing the boy in a new light. Padosi said, sure, thanks for sending Kalakar and the horse, but I'm sending them both back. You see, my daughter, Rajkumari, has fallen hopelessly in love with Kalakar. And since you sent me back my stable officer who stole her heart and the horse that she loves, it's best that you keep all three of them going forward. Rajkumari and Kalakar will be married and arrive back in your kingdom with the horse tomorrow. Raja felt proud. His son had done a solid job. He truly was an artist at stealing people's hearts. And now, thanks to him, Raja had made a strong alliance with a much more powerful Padosi. But most importantly, Raja's horse collection was now complete. The king did an internal debate about what he should start collecting next. Maybe NFTs of images of himself as a superhero perhaps? That's all for this time. A few notes. As is traditional on the show, the names of the characters reflect the roles they play. Raja means king. Padosi means neighbor. Gyani is scholarly. Nidar is fearless. Rajkumari means princess. And Kalakar means artist. Because this pilfering prince did indeed perfect the art of stealing. As for the moral of the story, there isn't one. Raja acts with questionable motives in trying to send his son into trouble. Kalakar probably destroyed some promising stable careers for other stable boys during his own meteoric rise to the top. In the next episode, we'll do another folk tale. This one is about a potter who decides to escape death. 
maybe he felt a little inspired by Savitri's story and by Nachiket's. But if he thought the outcome would be identical, he was a little mistaken. If you have comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories you'd like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.